Um, welcome to another episode of the Benny and the Bats podcast covering Boston Red Sox baseball. We are available on just every platform imaginable. We are downloaded in over 30 countries, and we are happy to have you with us for this episode. We will be covering a lot of what's going on right now, uh, you know, as we start uh, spring training 2.0, summer camp, whatever you want to call it, uh, everything from the virus to the pitching staff to uh, some of our expectations uh, going forward. Tonight, uh, joining me, you know, from the, the regular cast, Charlie Smith. Charlie, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Great to hear and see you as always. Yeah, absolutely. We know we're uh, that much closer to, uh, you know, opening day, barring Armageddon. So, uh, like I said, we'll definitely be getting uh, into it. Also joining us tonight is Moses Menendez from the Fenway Faithfuls podcast. We're actually doing a split show tonight, so their audience is hearing us right now, and uh, you know this show will will be hearing him. So two shows going on at once. Never done it before. Why not? Moses, how are you? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on Fenway Faithful podcast. I appreciate you guys doing this. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. This is the first time for everybody, so it's going to be a blast. Absolutely. So diving right into it, we may as well start with the elephant in the room. Uh, You know, the virus is kind of picking up steam. I noticed they're talking a lot about an uptick in cases. What you don't see a lot in the media compared to two, three months ago is, is the rising death toll. That's just not happening right now. So maybe... Maybe that's the good news in all of this, but there is, you know, an uptick of cases. Charlie, starting with you, what are your thoughts on the, uh, you know, developments surrounding the virus, you know, since we last recorded? Um, well, there are a couple of players that have, have opted out of their um, 2020 season. Uh, I know that uh, Zimmerman was one. Uh, I do believe the, the most recent one to be vocal about it for more than one reason was uh, Ian Desmond from the Rockies. I believe he opted out of his contract to spend time with his family. Um, I feel like it's going to happen more and more. The thing is, it's not the superstar players of the teams that are doing it. So, I, I mean, we knew this was going to happen. It was inevitable. There are going to be some people that say, you know what? I'd rather sit at home and, you know, I'll forego four million or three million or whatever the prorated salary was going to be. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, that's just one less person that people have to be worried about. That person doesn't have to worry at all either. They're going to be sitting with their wife, their kids, enjoying themselves. And that's fine, too. You guys have made more than enough money to survive. You guys are good. That's cool. It is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, luckily it is, you know, a bunch of older guys, you know, I, I hate to be brutal about this, but it's been a bunch of washed up 30 somethings that, you know, That's where it is. this older guy, yeah, their careers are pretty much over. You got Ryan Zimmerman, Ian Desmond, like you mentioned, Charlie, Mike Leake, uh, Tyson Ross and his younger brother, who I'm less familiar with, obviously, uh, yeah, had yeah, a younger brother. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Who, who is- oh yeah. Tyson. Ty- <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. Tyce, uh, Tyson Ross's little brother is Joe Ross. He was a pitcher for the Nationals. He's actually in his upper 20s, and he was actually one of the surprise players to um, to actually declare, yeah, I'm just I'm not going to I'm not going to play. Tyson Ross was good for like one year in San Diego. Ian Desmond's <laughs> like 35 or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's pushing he's, it. He's pushing it, too. But um, it, it's again, it's not the superstar player of these teams that are saying, you know what, no, it's not worth it. There are other players that are, you know, Ian Desmond, not the star player of of the Rockies by a long shot. Is he a good player on the team? Yes. Is he the star? He's not Nolan Arenado, and he doesn't come close to that. He he couldn't carry his jock. No way. But uh, Ian Desmond also uh, is speaking on behalf of more than one cause. So he's he's trying to make his voice known for that reason as well. That's fine. Uh, am, am I going to be sad because Ian Desmond doesn't play this year? No. Am I going to miss Joe Ross or Tyson Ross this year? No. Am I going to miss Mike Leake for not playing this year? No. Like, no. 
if 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 Mike Trout said, "Yeah, you know what, 2020, I'm just not going to do," it, I'd be like, "Oh shoot." Then it's a real fail. Then it's a fail. And then it's a real. Then it's a real thing. Ross's little brother. I mean, he's a bat boy. I don't know who that guy is. If Desmond <laughs> was in line for a 100 million dollar contract next season, you know, if he was a couple years younger, would he be opting out? <laughs> I, it sounds Probably like not. a stretch. No, no. Same, same with Ryan Zimmerman. If he was five years younger, he'd be playing. Yeah, he right, and Desmond, right. I think he was in the middle of like a five-year, $80 million deal. Something like it was, it was something where he got, um, what, like $10 million or something like that. But pro-rated, he was only going to make a fraction of that because they're doing pro-rated salaries and whatnot. So, no, I don't think a player that was going to be getting $30 million would have opted out. There's just no way. That's crazy. Absolutely. What are your thoughts more in depth, Moses? The COVID thing's been crazy, but we should have had baseball back about a month ago. And I think Manfred really dropped the ball on this whole deal. You know, we should be having opening day on 4th of July. Spring training should start on Memorial Day. There's nothing more American than that. Having baseball start on one American date and start on America's birthday. I mean, it was, he had, he had the, the easiest route to save baseball and make it something, and they didn't. Uh, obviously, COVID's real, and the numbers are kind of dying down in some areas. But all in all, he he fucked up big time with, with these deals. It's it's it is what it is, right? Guys are opting out. You know, guys are gonna opt out. And like Charlie said, it's the guys you don't really know their names because they're bat boys. Like up till five minutes, I don't know Ross had a little brother, so it's. <laughs> <laughs> It comes down to, I hate to say, but it is what it is. But now the boys are back. They started reporting yesterday. Some of them showed up today. Let's get down to baseball. Let's get into this shit. You know, we got a 60-game season. Let's make the best of it. Hopefully the playoff format is reasonable. And we see the Red Sox win number 10. Yeah, I mean, the surprising thing to me in the last 48 hours especially is a lot of Local beat writers as well as big national uh, beat writers as well. Just Ken Rosenthal today even throwing cold water on the chances of of this season actually getting off the ground and getting into motion, you know, because of the challenges of the virus. But I'm just look. I don't think it's that bad, especially now, because like I said, the death toll just isn't there. A lot of it is younger people that are asymptomatic, and I think a lot of baseball players are going to fall into that. Um, right. There's also no known, you know, serious cases right now of, you know, COVID-19 among MLB players. You know, they've all been fairly mild. That we know about. And I just think it's super critical to – Get this season going and get the trial and error stuff out of the way. That way, when 2021 comes around, we know how to handle it. And exactly. if there's universal enthusiasm amongst executives, players, and fans all across the board, let there be baseball. So I just I hate the cold water getting thrown on it. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand that neither. It's just, you know, we have a positive going. Stay with it. The country needs a positive to keep moving forward. You know, basketball put out their dates. Hockey put out their dates. Baseball has a date. So just keep going in the positives. And that's the biggest problem. That's why I think it took so long for this deal to come about. They're dwelling on the negativities of everything. The numbers are going down in depths. The cases are going down. They should look ahead at 2021, but we still have 2020 to focus on. I, uh, you did bring up something earlier, though. Like, baseball could have started on America's birthday. The thing with Manfred, though, is he's been so hot and cold. He's like a walking knuckleball. You don't know which direction he's going to go in. Like, I remember he mentioned um, four or five weeks ago, he mentioned that, uh, maybe it was less, I'm not sure, but he said that there was, there was already a deal. And there was no deal at all. There was nothing. <coughs> and it, it took the MLBPA to come out and say, you know what, this, that, that's actually not even true. Like, this is like 45 talking right now. This is actually complete fake news. Not real. Yeah. And yeah. so th that was an opportunity for everyone to, okay, cool, this is actually happening. When that happened, it was a slap in the face to baseball as a whole. Because when that happened, I sat there like, um, who's pulling the strings? Like, who's making the calls? Why are you saying, are you trying to, like, save face at this point? Because 
I have no idea why you're lying to us. Like, we're now, be- like, Terry, I remember last week, you're like, please, just like, just, I just want to see a couple pitches, like a couple games of baseball. Bring <laughs> baseball back. Like, we want to see it back, but we want to see it done the right way. If you really didn't have anything going, which you didn't, be transparent. Because people were going to be more upset finding out that you said, oh, yeah, we're good. And, and then there's nothing. Yeah, it, it, it's... That situation was handled so poorly. Manfred continues to lose support across the country because yeah. he can't get it done. We call him Manfred on our show. He's a fraud. He, he's just he's just garbage. Like, I he's like just a that. big fraud. And and you know all he did was lie throughout the whole thing. And it was like you said when that came out with the fake news as a fan, not as a Red Sox fan, but a baseball fan in general, it just pissed me off. Like that's just a slap to the face. Yeah, it's an insult. You know, and I think him lying slowed this down big time. He took the size of the owners. He, they didn't want to pay and they didn't want to play. And he didn't want a season, I believe, deep down. I don't think man fraud wanted a season. Man fraud. I love it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just think he was bowing to the owners too much. I, I saw him have some comments, I think, on a New York radio show where he said that they were never going to agree to more than 60 games. Like that was never in play from the get go. But I just think from a survival perspective, there has to be baseball this year. And I think Manfred does know that because if you look at some of the minor leagues, I listened to Buster only yesterday and apparently a lot of those teams are going to need government bailouts next year to, to keep things afloat. So I just think no baseball could be extremely detrimental to the the short term future of the game, at least. Well, I don't want to go off a deep end, but Manfred was trying to cut out sixty minor league affiliates this year, and then this hit, and now there's no minor league baseball. And I this goes back to him dragging his feet on this. I believe deep down that he dragged his feet so there'd be no minor league baseball. So when those teams, if they don't get a, a government bailout, they're gone. Minor league baseball we cut in half, and that's not fair to the to the local fans. You know, like I'm from New Jersey, and we have twelve affiliate teams in the area. I didn't drive to any team: Phillies, Red Sox, uh, even the Mets, a few other uh, the Bisons for for the Blue Jays. I didn't drive all around and get it. And he wants to cut these teams out, so he wants to cut minor league baseball out already. I don't understand why he's he wants to get rid of minor league baseball. So I I don't agree with with anything going on in the minors right now. There should be one minor league team per system, so there's still games being played in the system. I agree. I agree. And I just wonder with some of these Red Sox prospects, you know, Tanner Houck, Brian Mata, those guys are pitchers. Then you've got Tristan Casas and, uh, you know, one or two other decent hitting prospects that just aren't going to get their reps this year. And how far is that going to set them back? I they're mean, losing they're a year, really. Yeah, and – you know, if you were hoping to get them next May or June, you know, I don't I don't know if that timeline's realistic at this point. And even if you're a pitcher, you know, like Matt Moore when he was in the Rays, and this goes back, I think, twenty thirteen, he made three starts and then he pitched in the playoffs for him. There's nobody doing that this year. If you get a guy who goes down in September and you're playing in October, who are you going for for the backup? Everybody's home on the couch. You don't have a 40 man roster. You don't have anybody coming to help you anymore. So it's going to be, it's almost like this season is the best team's not going to win. It's going to be a team that survives going to win. That could that be. Could be. Yeah, that's a great observation. I, you know, and I don't know. I just, we'll get into it with the Red Sox rotation here uh, in just a minute. J- just one quick kind of, I-, I thought it was funny, you know, and uh, this is like the most Cushman thing ever. Yesterday, I was listening to Sean Doolittle express like intense concern that this season wouldn't start. He's a late inning reliever for the Nationals. And it was the lead a lot for him. Yeah. And <laughs> so he had a lot of concerns and, I saw the video because Buster only tweeted it and I retweeted it, excuse me, and I commented below. I said, he looks too scared to even record a strikeout. And then somebody responds to me with a question mark. And I said, I said, well, you know, his head's not going to be in the game. You know, I'm talking about Doolittle still. 
and she goes, it's a female that's interacting with me, and he go, she goes, and you felt the need to tell his wife this, because why? And I'm like, oh, it's his wife. And I was typing out a half-ass apology and kind of what my rationale was. I felt, you know, a little stupid. And uh, before I could even send the tweet, she uh, she blocked me. Um, so mo- we mo- talked about that, how they're soft, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, I didn't know I was mouthing off to the guy's wife, but my observations are still, you know, what they were. <laughs> Her block must be huge. That's her husband. Because he yeah. blew like 20 saves last year. He almost blew the playoffs for him. So her block list is probably 100 deep. So <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't lose any sleep about it. Yeah. Luckily, their uh, starting rotation was just so good that oh you know, it, it all set their bullpen. I mean, Scherzer was hurt, you know, most of September. And I thought, wow. You know, and he really turned it up. He wasn't good in the um, in the wild card game against the Brewers, but after that, he was he was phenomenal. He turned it on, oh, and yeah. another thing. Speaking of Scherzer, apparently there was some secret Sandlot camp going around. I saw that from the Athletic today. Scherzer, Verlander, Giancarlo Stanton were among many superstar players at this little Sandlot camp. This private little you know, camp they were holding down uh, somewhere in Florida. And uh, so <laughs> some of these guys are going to be ready to go right away. Yeah, well, I know Trevor Bauer does a thing on YouTube, live pitchings. So he's in the middle of the desert, and he's pitching to, like, hitters. He's been on it. A few of guys from the Reds have been on it. Uh, Eric Gagne pitched on it last week. Interesting stuff if you have time to go on YouTube. So he'll, he'll be looking good this year. That's a that's Bauer. a person I don't miss, Eric Gagne. You know, Trevor yeah. Bauer, he's actually in, he's involved in a couple of Twitter feuds, one of which is with Kurt Schilling. It's actually quite epic. If you have some time, that's worth a watch. That's worth a read, too. I didn't know that. I'd have to look I'd have to check that out. Oh, you gotta check that one out. Schilling blocked me too. He was <laughs> another guy. I got tagged into this little argument and uh I was arguing with Kurt Schilling, not knowing he was Kurt Schilling, because his, his Twitter handle is at Gehrig38. So how the hell am I supposed to know that's Kurt Schilling? You right. Know? And, and uh, I had to look Schilling up for some reason, uh, and I couldn't find him. And then I realized that I was blocked. So must have been from whatever that was. But my list is getting uh, longer. And I don't seek these guys out, too. So that's that's the funny thing. That is funny. Yeah. But, but anyway, so uh, getting into some Red Sox-related uh, stuff here, um, Ron Renicki said a day or two ago that Nathan Avoldi would be ready to start next week if the season you know, were coming up that quick. So um, I guess that's kind of encouraging to hear. Well, he was lights out in spring training. He was just unhittable, and I was excited to see him pitch. It was a nice change from what we saw in the past. I mean, that's for darn sure. Um, it, it'll be great to see him right the ship because last year was such a disaster. Um, outside of, I feel like, that one game he pitched, I think it was against the Yankees. He went six innings, allowed one hit. Like, just not there. Just how in the world, Dave Dombrowski, did you give this man a four-year, 60-plus million dollar deal? What were you thinking? They should have made so, him sit out after that elbow surgery last year. Oh, that was just, it was, it was brutal. Like after the world series, that's not the time to start delving out major contracts. You just don't do that. That was just stupid. Well, what bothered me on that deal was like, you, you ditch out the money, but you don't do a physical. And then he throws three pitches in spring training. Up oh, my elbow. Needed, needed a scoped out. Huh? Yeah. Did... Yeah. Not a good look. Yeah. I mean, see, if this was a 162 game season, you know, he would be a fourth or fifth starter. I would expect him to go on the DL at some point. I have serious concerns as to whether or not that arm will hold up for more than 100, 120 innings. He's had two Tommy John surgeries on it, two separate surgeries aside from that for loose bodies in his elbow, which, you know, one of which was last year, like right. you said. So, I mean, if we're looking at 162, I'd be an extreme pessimist about Evaldi. You know, 60 games, the innings count will be down. Um, 
in a short sample size, anybody can get hot. I mean, Wade Miley, like I said last week, could win the Cy Young this year, you know, if they still have that stuff on a short sample size. So, you know, it's just one of those situations where you just got to hope for the best, you know. I think it's tailor made for him, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully. You got any thoughts, Charlie? No, I mean, you bring up some, some great points. Um, here's the thing about Nathan Avaldi: We have a 60-game season. If he ends up getting injured and gets wrecked in this 60-game abridged season, I have no faith that he will last the next two years. None whatsoever. If he can survive this, he will maybe meet my expectations. But if he gets injured... All bets are off in 2021 and 2022. It will look as it will look like potentially Dave Dombrowski's second worst signing. I, I agree with that. I think he's he probably this year. He'll be in the bullpen the next two years. So well, that's that's well, that's that, if it was 162, because they had to put him there last year, and then sale went down. And they had to bring him back to the rotation, but they just didn't know what the hell to do with him last year. He was so bad for the most part. Last and, year when he came back, it was kind of like they wanted him to work in. That's all it was. And they just sort of sat him out, honestly. They wanted him to his work in, but, you know, a pitcher needs confidence. I and mean, he goes out there and he gets shelled time after time after time. It ain't going to help the guy. Yeah. Yeah. So – It'll just be interesting to – well, they're, they're not going to get to face a lot of uh, live batters because I think they're only looking at a few uh, exhibition games right before the season starts. So it's going to be mostly workouts over these next few weeks. But, uh, you know, he's essentially, I think, our number two. I, I don't know how Martin Perez fits in. He is a bona fide starter, so I, I think that's how he'll be handled. Um, but – I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think the way it's going to look, you have Erod one, which is insane to think because last year Erod was your four. I think last year it was Sale, Price, uh, Evaldi, Erod, and then fifth was Porcello. <laughs> was oh, that's right, Porcello. I forgot about him. That nightmare. The poor uh, guy. It, I mean, Jesus. And and now you have Erod jumping into the pole position. Nate Evaldi is your two option. Your three option is Martin Perez, who is somebody's number five or six on another team. Like on a crappy team, he's a five or a six. We're seeing a – well, he was a five on a 100-win team last year. I, I – Martin – here's the thing. Martin Perez started off like gangbusters last year. And then forgot where the plate was. It just, it was terrible. Because Brian Johnson. You, you, oh, I, I don't do that to me. You know not to, oh, you don't know that. Not I to don't Brian know. Johnson. I don't. Yeah, I, no, I, I can't I do it. But uh, uh, Ryan Weber was someone that we talked about. I imagine he's going to be one of the guys. If he's not official, he should be. We know sales obviously done. Uh, Colin McHugh looks to be number five, unless they pick up somebody else. Chris Maza is going to be in the hunt, too. Chris Maza has a good live arm. That was a good move from the Mets. I forgot so, about so him. Ma I forgot about him, too. So Maza could potentially be in there, too. But, I mean, uh, McHugh is, is, is babying the arm, like he already mentioned, I, to. I think uh, he's going to be a reliever, honestly, McHugh. I hope so. Because if he comes in as a starter, I mean, what, what he's already told everybody is, uh, I'm, I'm babying my arm. If I start to feel a pinch or a, or a little twinge, He's I'm not pitching. Yeah. I'm not pitching. He literally told him, like, I'm, I'm listening to my body. I don't care what you say. If it hurts, I'm not pitching. So, okay, fine. You're on your own regiment, whatever. That's fine. I, can I trust you to be the fifth starter? No, but I, I nope. again, Chris Maza, I didn't think of him. Good call. Yeah. I, I see it being Erod, Nathan, Perez, Maza, and then uh, I just see Weber as the fifth. Because Weber had... Good, good signs last year. This will be his second year. He had some time last year. He'd be a good fifth starter. It really is a, a, a toss-up for the fifth, but you know, but who he's up against? Brian Johnson is trash. Uh, McHugh already seems like he's going to be in and out, so just keep him in the bullpen. It'd be a perfect fit for him. Well, I saw a tweet today uh, from one of the beat writers that that had. 
Erod number one, and then either Avoldi or Martin Perez two and three in, in some combination. And then Weber was listed fourth, and then Brian Johnson fifth. So, I I mean, obviously that could change over the next several yeah. days. Colin McHugh had a non-surgical procedure done on his uh, forearm because of a flexor strain. I have yet to see, and there might be one or two examples if you go back a number of years, but I've never seen anyone come back with – with the flexor tendon issue and didn't have Tommy John. Like, it's always inevitable. We knew that was going to happen with Chris Sale. Who, who was it? Tanaka. Tanaka had that done. Oh, he had the PRP injections, I think. Because he, he had, had a partial tear of the UCL. Okay. I, I didn't know that. I know he did have a partial tear of the UCL. So that, that was, a, you know an example, you know, with PRP injections, but yeah. it just doesn't for the most part seem to work out. And you also, I'm not saying this is definitely a factor, but McHugh is going to be essentially pitching the rest of the year for free because he was advanced a certain amount of his contract. And then where you, they're only being paid 60 games prorated at this point. Um, He's just not getting paid. He actually would have owed money, but I guess there was a clause where that gets forgiven in, in a situation like this. So I don't know if that'll play a factor with McHugh, but you would think he would want to, you know, play a part here and maybe boost his value for next year because he's only here on a one-year deal. But you know, I just don't know what to what to think about him really at this point. Yeah, what's the elbow that's involved in the flexor? You're right. You, it's inedible. You're not at the surgery. I don't know why he's even – But if I was a pitcher and I had that option, I'm getting it done on a season like this. It's a lost season. Yeah, absolutely. I think I don't think we had quite gone into virus mode when, when he had signed that. But, you know, it's it's just – it's a mess. My, my, my uh, expectations for him are pretty low. Uh, another thing as well, Bloom said that there would definitely be an opener used. So I, he didn't elaborate, you know, if that's every game, if it's maybe just the the um, Weber, Johnson, and maybe Maza starts. Yeah, maybe. I, I have no idea. But a, a couple of guys to possibly look at um, if, if that's going to happen is uh, Kyle Hart. Last year, in nine starts with Double uh, A Portland, he had a 2.91 ERA. Got called up to Pawtucket, started uh, 15 there, had a 3.86 ERA in Triple A. So th- those numbers definitely look, you know, opener worthy. Maybe long relief type stuff. You know, he hasn't, um, you know, he didn't pitch in the big leagues last year, so you know, it's tough to tell. Um, Matt Hall as well, um, 16 games last season, had a 7.71 ERA, uh, five games, and those might have even been in the bullpen, actually, those 16 games, five games in 2018, 14.63 ERA, so that was a bloom move, one of the earlier ones, uh, Hall comes from the Detroit system, so I don't know what Bloom sees there, but obviously there was a little bit of genius with, uh, you know, some of those Tampa starters or pitchers, I should say. Uh, yeah, so the small moves like Chris Mazza, I'm not against. As you know, Heim Bloom has that eye for for small talent. So we see moves like that, I get a little excited because it's something new. It's not a, we're going to buy a big name. We're going to go with the smaller name talent. Yeah, I'm I'm intrigued. You know, I was happy with. The fact that they, you know, replaced, you know, Dombrowski with him. I was kind of hoping they would look at Tampa, maybe look at Houston. This was before the, you know, the bombshell uh, athletic reports came out. But, uh, yeah, and maybe even the Dodgers organization. I mean, those are three teams that just seem to have it figured out. And- I thought the guy from the Dodgers was definitely a lot for the GM. I forget his name. It was so oh, long Friedman. ago. Yeah. Tampa Friedman. See, I I mean, there has to be an allure with, you know, being the GM or president of baseball ops for the Red Sox. Like, there's this romantic allure about it. 
But if you look at what Friedman's done with the Dodgers, that system has a very balanced payroll right now with some spending flexibility. They've got some talented prospects coming up. I think um, Walker Bueller is going to be an absolute stud for the next decade. So, I mean, it took a lot of work to get that team to that point. So, it, to me, it was like, you know, does he really want to walk away from that when it's like at its peak right now and they can really do some damage? So, you know, I wasn't shocked when he ended up signing, you know, his extension. But um, but nonetheless, you know, I'm glad, you know, Bloom ended up being the, the candidate. Hard to believe Bloom was the runner up to Brody Van Wagenen in, in the oh, match who had no baseball experience whatsoever other than the fact he was an agent, you know, wow. never an executive. I'm happy they dodged that bullet. Bueller, you know, it's funny you brought him up earlier too. Bueller was an interesting situation because he was uh, he was an injury recovery story. Most people forgot about that, but he uh, he ended up making a major comeback because he was injured for the longest time. He ended up having shoulder surgery, I believe, and then he ended up throwing harder after surgery, which was weird because usually most people don't throw harder after it. He ended up getting better after surgery. Yeah, he's a rare breed. Yeah, and he's a machine. And, and he was not on the draft radar after he got hurt. So they, they saw something to him that nobody else did. Yep. He's a kid, too. He's like 24, 25, something like yeah. that. He's, he's, he's yeah. a stud. I wasn't familiar with uh, his injury history. I mean, he kind of rose up in the 2018 season, and a lot of Red Sox fans forget he was the starting pitcher for the Dodgers in that epic 18-inning, you know, game three where, where Evaldi – you know, also was a hero. So, um, you know, pitched very well, you know, in, in a big game. And, you know, the Red Sox came back to uh, send it in extra innings. But, um, but yeah, I if he can stay healthy, he's certainly, uh, you know, going to be a stud. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other uh, pitching? Uh, we're going to get to Luke Roy in a minute, but is there anything I uh, left out? as far as the pitching went? You covered a lot. I mean, it's going to be interesting because there's there's a lot of small-name players, and it's going to be exciting to watch, like we said, because a lot of guys would be in a minor league roster going into the year. There's a lot of opportunity, and it could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. Absolutely. So, Charlie, uh, what do you make of uh, Luke Roy being added up into the uh, player pool right now for the Red Sox. I guess that stands at 48 at the moment. So he'll be coming into camp and he'll be competing against uh, Kevin Ploiecki. And I'm going to boldly assume <laughs> Christian Vasquez has nothing to worry about. So yeah, him so, fitting in. So here, here's the thing. Like I, I, I'm glad you brought up Luke Croy. And the fun thing about Luke Croy is when I think of him, I think of uh, – uh, Grandpa Ross, when he was uh, a member of the Sox <laughs> last year, th- this is this is what it was back because David Ross actually, when he came to Boston in 2013, uh, or sorry, 2018, um, no, no, 2013, sorry, when he came to the Red Sox, that was his second stint. He actually came the year after the Red Sox won the World Series, and he didn't do anything. Like he had like maybe one hit, something like menial, and then he left, and then he came back on like a. I'm going to serve as the backup, but not really just the backup role. So he was going to be a mentor, a leader in the clubhouse, and kind of really get that role a little bit of meaning. Last year, we had, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. We had eight guys hit almost 20 home runs or more. So we had six with 20 or more. Uh, Michael Chavis and then Mitch Moreland were the only guys that didn't crack the 20 number. You had Christian Vasquez, who's going to be your starting catcher this year, who had 23. You had Bradley with 21. Betts, 29. He's gone. Uh, J.D. Martinez, 36. Bogey with 33. Devers with 32. I'm not expecting Jonathan Lucroy to come in and do crazy work. But what I am expecting him to do is become a great leader. When David Ross came to Boston, he hit 216, hit four homers, 10 RBIs, a stolen base, got a couple of runs. We don't know what he's going to do this year, but the year prior to joining the new team to be that leader, uh, their numbers are very, very similar. So I'm hoping that Luke Roy can do uh, what David Ross was able to do back in 2013. And yes, it's just an abridged season, 
Who knows what's going to happen? I personally would rather have Luke Roy than Plawicki on my team. Plawicki is a hard round ball to short. That's all he is. And uh, going back to Chevis and Moreland, they were both hurt too, don't forget. So they never really did a fair shot at the 20 home runs last year. I was there. So, so Terry already knows this. I, I actually was there when uh, Michael Chavis hit his first career home run. So I will forever be immortalized in That's awesome. Red Sox video history. Yeah, I can Google. Yeah, I can Google that home run. I see myself. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Awesome. Him. Wait. Yeah, w- with Luke Roy here, I'll, I'll have a Chavis comment in a second. But basically, I'm just looking for a guy who can handle the pitching staff similar to how Leon did. We knew Leon wouldn't have a good bat for the most part. He had like one nice, you know, power streak per year where, you know, he'd have a good week or two and 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 could mash, you know, if he could barrel up the ball. But uh, but Leon just it seemed like certain guys in the pitching staff were just better with him catching. You know, Rick Porcello was a good yeah. one. David Price in 2018 started the year with Vasquez, wasn't pitching great, switched to Leon, pitched fairly well down the stretch. And you know, if Luke Roy ends up being that guy that can maybe work with Ryan Weber really well, you know, then I'm all for it. And that'll be good enough for me. And if there's, you know, production with the bat, that's a big bonus. In 2018, Luke Roy played 126 games with the uh, Oakland A's, who were, I think, a 97-win team that year. And he was handling a pitching staff that on paper didn't look very sexy. You know, uh, Edwin Jackson was one of them. A lot of openers. Um, Yeah, I wish I would have looked up their rotation because a lot of their names uh, escape me right now. But it it was basically a rotation with a bunch of number four guys at best because Manaya went on the DL shortly after pitching that no-hitter against the Red Sox with a shoulder issue and and you know so that that could be you know a little bit of an indication that maybe Luke Roy does work well but I haven't seen a lot from Ploiecki so I I can't really make you know any type of of judgments there but if he can have that same effect then you know I I hope he wins the job so I'm just looking for some of you know that Sandy Leone type stability when it when it comes to game calling because he was phenomenal. Yeah, and everybody knows that's where Vasquez lacks is the defensive side of calling a game. Wait, say that again. Uh, you know that that's where a lot of that's where that's Vasquez's down point is calling a game. In eighteen, oh. Price switched oh. them out. Sale wouldn't pitch to him. You know, Sale was healthy and Price was here. And for Solo was there. Half your pitching staff won't pitch to him. So exactly. Yeah. And Sale is probably, you know, I know he's finicky in the second half of the season and, you know, he's dealing with Tommy John right now. But when he's healthy, he's one of the most talented pitchers of his era. So when when he won't pitch to Christian Vasquez, that's pretty telling. Right. Right. And that guy, he's like you said, he's a lot trick when he's healthy. So. Right. Well, Lucky did deal with Syndergaard, uh, Mats, the Drum, Harvey, Wheeler, the best pitching staff to never win anything. That's what a lot of oh, people said. Yeah, I forgot he was with the Mats. He just came from Cleveland, but yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, that was a that was a pitching rotation with the Mats that you thought could be World Series caliber, and they just completely, so you know, underachieved every year. Yeah. Absolutely. And then they had a dumpster fire situation with, uh, um, what's his name there from the Astros, Beltran. And just, it seems like that organization is just a huge dumpster fire. Like they should literally burn their stadium down and then rebuild. Like I think, I think that needs to be part of the, you know, their rebuild process to finally get things going. Cause I don't think Van Wagenen is the guy who's going to turn that organization around. That Luis Rojas, I, I've read nothing but good things about him. You know, he got hired after they uh, awkwardly got rid of Beltran. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I, I don't hate the Mets. You know, I, I wish they were the best team in New York. So because that would, you know, 
you know, kill the Yankees, but, but yeah. So anyway, real quick, just on Chavis, like, what is he? I like him. I like his energy. He's got a very good positive vibe. He's always goofing off, you know, on social media. I like that. I think that's good for the team. And, but it just seems like he could be Chris Davis on the Orioles 2.0 and just completely All have, a, have a dead dud season. Yeah. With millions of strikeouts. He could be Chris Davis on the A's and hit for about 250 and mash 40 bombs a year. I could see that. And I think his ceiling is probably a Kevin Euclid type guy. And that might be a reach right now, but I, I think that that probably is his ceiling. So, like, what is he to you guys? I think he, you know, we won't know until another two seasons as to what the season is. But I, I think we can't really judge him. That We had such a small sample last year, and he was really good when he was healthy. So I need to see more of him. But I'm excited to watch him, and I think he's just a replacement for Pedroia now. That's all I think. You don't think that Peraza kid from uh, Cincinnati will? Oh, Terry, stop it. No way. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. Now, I'm, I'm a little biased because I did get to see him play. I'll admit I was a little for I, – I was kind of jumping on the MC bandwagon um, because when he came and he hit so hard, so well, so quickly, it was, it was like Dustin who? We don't need you anymore. Just retire. Hang up the cleats. Don't worry. We got a guy who can field and, you know, do what you can't do, which is hit the ball and stay healthy. Um, so stay healthy. Thought, what is that? That's, the, that's the big deal. But then we kind of saw a little bit of regression. We saw this, like, 330, 340 batting average drop to 250. So you don't drop to 250 by hitting 250. You drop to 250 because you're hitting 200. Right. Um, so there was a major bit of regression there. Um, but you know what? Freshman, freshman year, this is your first shot at the show. There's sometimes sophomore slump. Who knows if he gets a little bit better. There have been, there have been players out there that people have lauded as superstars. Aaron Judge was one of them, but he was during the you know potential, their cameras in center field issue year. Um, and he didn't really do diddly squat year two it was a fraction of of his campaign so if if michael chavis does what he does um in 20 you know in 2021 what he did in 2019 i will take that as as a bit of a, a, a growing year because i'm not expecting him to hit more than maybe six seven home runs this year if we're lucky you know so um, I, I can't count him out i i really hope he doesn't just become a, a kevin euclid type journeyman uh, I especially hope he doesn't hold the bat the way he does because that was just sinful. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to say that he's going to buck the trend and be. I'll I'll do this. I'll say this, Terry. He'll be better than Euclid, maybe not as good as Pedroia, just to make you happy. Well, even with Pedroia's bad four years on healthy, he's still a career three hundred hitter. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's hard to do. And if he wasn't hurt, I think. If you go back before his injuries, he was career like 320. So that's, that's hard. I, I don't think we can really count this year against him. I think it has to be in two years. This, this 60 games, remember, it's 60 games. So he's going to play maybe 52 of them, 50. So it, it's hard to judge these numbers off of, off of what he could be. He'd be really good, right? He'd have a good 50 games and be a, a 480 hitter. Or he'd, be, he'd struggle, be a 200 hitter in a one sissy game year, but – only that, like, 140, 150. So this year, could we hurt him or help him because of the lack right. of games? That's a good point. Yeah. Or go ahead, Charlie. Oh, no, no. I'm just agreeing. I say good point. Yeah. See, last season, he didn't come up right away because they were worried about his, his you know, poor defense on the corners. They thought he just needed more reps, in, you know, in Pawtucket and – you know, then they would call him up. And the day before he got called up, they were still saying he wasn't ready. But then Nunez and Holt went on the DL like a day apart. And then Pedroia, that whole experiment had failed, you know, last year. And then they had no choice but to call him up. And then they threw him at second 
where he had never really played and was more than adequate. And I think he could be potentially a corner outfielder if they need to, you know, especially left field. I mean, you know, so it wouldn't surprise me to to see some some reps out there, if not during the regular season, maybe next spring training. But his versatility definitely surprised me. And I'm rooting for him. Like I said, I, I like him. Um, I'm a big fan of him, yeah. So here, yeah. here's the thing, though. When, when we look at what Dustin Pedroia did, if we look into or take into account the last, you know, three years, because the last two years he played nine games, he had three hits, and he had 34 at-bats. He hit under 100. That's terrible. He had seven homers, 63 RBIs, 122 hits, in 114 games. Michael Chavis played 95 games, some of which did not even start. He was just pinch hitting. He had 18 home runs, more than twice that, and almost the same number of RBIs, 58, as opposed to 62. He didn't walk as much. He struck out a heck of a lot more. But, I mean, the bat is there. Can the fielding get better? I think it can. I think so. Give, give him time. Let him learn the position more. I agree. Okay. Yeah, give him a chance. Last topic before we wrap. Um, here's a question, and I, I posed this on Twitter. Not a lot of people really jumped on it. Uh, you know, I don't think people are really in the swing of things uh, just yet anyway. But here's a question for you guys. If Ron Renicky somehow gets this team – into the playoffs, even if it's just the wild card. And because I'm certainly not expecting them to. I mean, on paper, this isn't, you know, a playoff team. But if it happens, if there's some magic with Renicky, with maybe some magic from Bloom sprinkled in, does he get a contract extension for next season and maybe the season after? Because he's, this is the only year of his deal. Who is that, Renicky? Yeah, Renicky. So, do you extend him if we get into the playoffs? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go first. So, uh, we actually have a movement on our podcast. It's called the MC. Uh-oh. We believe Uh-oh. we believe Mookie, Cora, and Lesser are all coming back next year. We think <laughs> Mookie's going to sign a blockbuster deal. Cora is already talking about he can't wait to be a manager again, and Lester wants to play for Boston again. So, and Renicky already has come out and said he doesn't have plans to long term managing in the league so i think running is a one-year deal i wouldn't count him out of anything because in 60 games anything could happen this team to mess around and go 48 and 12 and they also go 12 and 48 real fast you don't know what you're gonna get but i i think we're gonna see cora and fenway managing the red Sox 2021 or 2022 we covered this last week, and uh, I think all but w- there's five of us that that co-host this show, and um, four out of the five are pretty adamant that Cora won't be back. And okay. if you listen to Bloom's statements, he throws a lot of cold water on it, and and says he stands by the decision to move on from him. And I just I just think if you bring Cora back. Every misdemeanor offense that we might get caught up in, some stupid minor bullshit, is going to get blown up into a felony. And, you know, I don't think Bloom wants to put him in a position, put himself in a position to get suspended like Lunau did. And I think Lunau was definitely, with the Astros, dirtier than, you know, what he admitted to. But... Um, I just, it's a, it's an extreme long shot that Cora comes back. I think if they don't stick with Renicky, it'll be Matt Quatrero, the uh, Tampa Bay's bench coach. Okay, I do think he's going to Tampa. He's going to do that pipeline to Tampa. Possibly, yeah. I don't know who else would be available. I don't think he would go after a Buck Showalter type guy. Or, no, you know, no, no. He won't fit. He won't fit in. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I just think it's it's a long shot right now for Cora. Do you think you just see a Veritek coming in the manage in two years? Well, that's the you know the thing that people clamor for, and I'd kind of like to see him do a full season as, as like a bench coach type thing before he does get elevated, you know, to that role. 
But I was at the winter weekend when Tora quit. And Veritech was the biggest talk of the whole weekend. And they were swearing he was the next coach, he was the next coach. So I just, you know, I've always, I, I never thought of him as a coach, honestly. But well, I would, he should definitely be like a bench okay. coach, kind of like what Tora did. Yeah, he's some type of consultant right now, but you you did see him if you were looking for him in the dugout during games in uniform last season. So it just it's just depends on Bloom. You know, every GM or whatever his title is, they all have fancy titles nowadays, but all of them guys have one manager, two tops to to kind of make their career, you know, with their franchise. And, you know, and then usually they get fired, you know. So, um, you know, Dombrowski had his too. Uh, Epstein, well, Epstein had Francona the whole time. But, um, you know, Sherrington had two managers under him. And so it just, it just depends, you know, on Bloom, I guess. I- I'll also say this, though. I hate seeing teams get too heavy with the analytics and sabermetrics. I kind of like the idea that the manager calls the shots. Ideally, they would be open to the, um, you know, the analytics and everything. But I hate it when the front office is the be-all and end-all about that. I kind of liked the fact that Cora, you know, you could tell he was the manager of the team. And, you know, Joe Girardi, you know, was – throughout his Yankees tenure, and, and Francona always has been. So, you know, I hope that we do, you know, we do have a manager that that at least carries the most influence. But going back to my original question, though, I think it would be amazing if the Red Sox did get into the playoffs. And if, you know, if, if Renicky, if they thrive off of Renicky, I wouldn't mind seeing him come into it. For... I'm, a, I'm a Ron Renegade guy. I was big on him in Milwaukee in 07 when they had Ben Sheets and CeCe and, and all of them. I mean, that was exciting to watch. Yeah, and I mean, look at the Braves with Brian Snicker. He was an interim guy to finish out the season after Freddie Gonzalez got fired. And ever since being the manager, I think he's had two full seasons and they've gotten into the playoffs both times. And they had that epic meltdown in game five in the first inning against the Cardinals. But I mean, they were looking like they could possibly be in the NLCS last year. So, and he's an older guy like Renicky as well. So, uh, you know, I like seeing stories like that and, you know, go back to LaBello. I mean, he was the bench coach of the Red Sox and then John Farrell went on that cancer leave. The Red Sox were the best team in baseball in September, uh, excuse me, August and September of that year. And, you know, unfortunately, the damage was done before that. And, you know, we weren't a playoff team, but that team was so fun to watch under under Lavello. I mean, Jackie Bradley went on an absolute tear, you know, with Lavello. Never went back to the minors after that either. Oh. Uh, Joe Kelly was 8-0 as a starter that, that final stretch of the year uh, with Blake Slyhart catching him, no less, you know, so... I just, if the team responds, I just, I'm totally good with, with Renicky, you know, being the guy, but I have no idea what the front office, you know, is thinking right now. You never know in baseball, like you go back to the statistics and the numbers, you never know. And I think the, the coach you're looking for, the shoot from the hip coach, like the Cora, there's not a lot of them left anymore. And I think Renicky is one of the last of the dying breeds, you know, even the guy in LA, Roberts, he was all numbers. And you know about the game yeah. one when Eduardo Nunez is a home run. He went lefty versus righty. He went curveball against this guy. He wasn't going to hit him, and, and they beat him. And you can't, you can't go – the game is played by man. You have to be called by man. That's why I don't agree with these robotic umpires. I don't agree with statistics. Let the pitcher face the hitter let the, and go on your gut. It's a game. It's a game of feeling. You have to go by feeling. Renicky Renicky will end up being back I think next year no matter what. I don't think the Red Sox are are going to can a guy after not even getting a full opportunity like a real chance to prove himself. 60 games you can't even that's not even half the season. You got to yep. give this guy a full year, give him a full squad uh, because he's also not he he also has I mean 
LOL to the rotation, and he's expected to get like 30 wins out of that? Like, give me a break. If this was a full season, he'd be lucky to get 50, maybe 54 wins. This, this, it was not a 60-win team even in a, in a full season. That just wasn't going to happen. Um, so I think you got to give him 2021, maybe 2022, and then you just kind of play it by ear from there. Because, yes, he is one of the last of a dying breed manager uh, of, of that era. Because now you have these, these new generation guys. You have the Joe Girardis that are coming in. You have the, the Gabe Kaplers that I'm still trying to understand how he's managing. But he's got a job. You have, um, <laughs> you, you know, f- for the longest time, you had Tony La Russa, Bobby Cox, Dusty Baker, uh, you, you know, um, uh, oh, God, the guy from the Nationals. What's his name? Uh, David Johnson, like all of these guys that were 60, 70, 80 years old that were around. Dusty Baker's back in the league, man. He's in Houston. You know, who, who, who's this? Dusty Baker. Baker ba- Baker's back, right? But he's been around for a lot. I mean, Baker's been in San Francisco. He's been in Chicago. He doesn't discriminate. He doesn't care. He loves baseball. Like, he's, he's wonderful like that. But here's the thing. Remember when they were the names and the the young? I mean, some of the younger managers were like the Red Sox manager. We had like Joe Kerrigan after Jimmy Williams. Like he was in his fifties. He's thirty years younger than some of the older managers. Uh, those were the managers that I remember as a kid. Managers were always seventy years old that were around during the time of Jesus. You know, these guys knew exactly what was coming in baseball. They didn't need cameras or any BS going on. Uh, Renicky, I think, is going to be one of the last ones of that era. Again, because you have a whole new wave coming in, it's going to change. Uh, eventually, Renicky won't be coaching anymore, uh, and you know you're going to have Joe Girardi as the longest tenured manager in baseball. It's going to happen, something like that. I miss, I miss seeing uh, some of those managers go off. Like I would pay good money to see Bobby Cox go off one more time in my life because that man was. I mean, you just. He was awesome. He he was Atlanta baseball. I agree. Him, Lou Pinella, another one oh, who would go off. Oh, Lou. Sweet Lou. You mentioned uh, Dave Roberts Moses, and he is was a perfect example of a guy who's a manager in name only because the front office, you know, is is too analytical. And that's why Madeline's know, not there anymore. Who's not there? Uh, Madeline. Yeah, he's, Madeline. he's in Miami. He was in LA before him, and they threw him out because he wanted to play by their system. He went on his gut. He wanted to manage his style. He wanted a new contract, and he said he didn't want to be a coach in a lame duck year. So he said, I'm out if you don't give me the deal. Yeah, he wanted to coach his yeah. team. I know the Astros, you know, obviously cheated that season, and there was evidence of it in the World Series, but. You know, I think the Dodgers lost the World Series in Game 7 when they went with Darvish and not uh, Alex Wood, who took a no-hitter into the seventh inning of uh, Game 4. You know, they could have just started Wood for three innings, knowing that Kershaw was coming in for two or three innings, and then they could have split it up between Morrow and Jansen and maybe won Game 7. But the, the analytics mindset that they embraced so hardcore, I think, bit them. And you know, potentially cost them a championship. So that's why I hate to see it embraced to that level. And then they did the following year with the Red Sox, and, and, and Nunez is at bat, and other plays in, in 18. You know, they just follow it too much. You got you to gotta shoot from the hip. You got to have that gut feeling, how to play the game. Absolutely. All right, uh, you know, that's about all I had. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap Uh, I'm good. Uh, you know, I I think we're gonna be surprised by the team this year. I think we're gonna. This is gonna be a year we see who Hein Bloom really is. I, I'm I'm interested in all his moves. It's gonna be a, a, a it's gonna be two things: a really good looking year, a really ugly looking year. But I'm just gonna decide if baseball is back finally. I don't know about you guys. Hey Terry. Yeah. We're gonna have baseball in 2020. <laughs> Hopefully, I, you know, if you listen to Dr. Fauci, you know, we're all going to be dead in a couple months. But, um, uh. but yeah, I mean, hopefully. And, and I think the more other sports see baseball kind of treading water and, you know, staying above the surface, I think that will give them more hope, you know, especially the NFL. 
and you know they'll kind of get running and you know america needs their sports so you know right. I, i'd hate hate to see the plug get pulled here and and you know it's it's day to day hour to hour just watching the news reports and t- yeah, listen to the all the gloom and doom they've been giving us but um yeah so we'll see um you know and one thing we didn't talk about was the team isn't allowed to reveal who tests positive uh, for it so that's going to be hard to gauge in uh you know spring training 2.0 but it's not like we can hide Raphael Devers you know if he's <laughs> in a couple of weeks. the Yankees can't hide Aaron Judge so we're kind of gonna know I guess the league can release the overall statistics and say, okay, this number of players tested positive today across the league. So that's something we can watch for. And if that number stays low, there should be baseball. I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Great show. Uh, Glad we could have you on, Moses. Thanks for having me out, guys. Yeah, yeah, thanks for joining. And your audience uh, enjoys it as well. So have a good night. You Take too, care, guys. guys. Night.